We do want to begin right now with NBC's Vaughn Hilliard. He is in Phoenix, where the president is headed early this week. NBC News White House correspondent Monica Alba is joining us as well. We'll get to Monica in a moment. Vaughn, I want to start with you. Mr. Trump says he was talking about cars. We have heard similar, though, inflammatory comment from him throughout his campaign. You witness it on a regular basis. Most recently, the focus has been heavily about undocumented immigrants, who he said are, quote, not people. How is all of this playing right now? Right. This is, I think, what we should expect from Donald Trump here in the months ahead. His campaign has even indicated it's not like he's going to be having daily campaign rallies. So instead, he's going to focus largely on the weekends. And what you saw this weekend was in Dayton, Ohio. A Republican nominee for president of the United States suggests that he views some of the migrants coming into the United States as not even people. He suggested, while standing on stage, that those January 6 defendants were, in his words, hostages. There was a rendition of the star Spangled Banner that played, that was sung by some of those January 6 defendants. And of course, he, in the last 36 hours, has pushed back on the, quote, bloodbath remarks. Of course, he made that specific remark while talking about the auto industry. He has pressed that if there was a second Biden administration, there would be a bloodbath in the auto market. Of course, during his own four years in the White House, there were just about 45,000 auto industry jobs added, several plants in in fact, did close. There is much that could be judged over the distinctions between the Biden and the Trump administration's approach to the auto industry in the United States. But you've also got to take into account on its own social media platform just last night calling for the prosecution of Liz Cheney. For Donald Trump, there is a lot at stake, of course, on the legal front. As he prepares for the criminal trial in New York City over the alleged hush money payments. But it just this morning, his own attorney in New York filing a motion uh, to stay the more than $450 million that he owes by next Monday, stemming from the financial fraud decision in New York against him and the Trump organization. For Donald Trump, he is taking an aim at everyone and everything that is coming for him, his family, his business, and his political future, Peter. You make a lot of good points there. I think it's worth noting, as you and I both witnessed, Vaughn, that the former president really plays in that delicate space, right, between controversy and condemnation in the eyes of a lot of folks. He always knows how to sort of raise the temperature here and can always uh, fall back on the suggestion that it was not about what his critics say it was. We let Americans make those decisions for themselves. Monica, I want to ask you, ahead of his West Coast swing early this week, the president today, as we showed, is focusing on women's health, reproductive rights, obviously a crucial issue for this campaign. His campaign, the president's did just announce what is a massive haul, $53 million that they raised last month alone. Talk about his priorities right now. We've seen a lot more of him on the road in the course of the last couple of weeks following the State of the Union. Exactly, Peter. The campaign announced that he and the vice president were going to be blanketing every single battleground state in the weeks that followed in what they're calling this March month of action. And they are trying to basically tout by every metric imaginable where they are seeing some of this momentum. Fundraising was a big haul over the weekend and focus that they're really trying to say we're going to put that money now toward this very long general election. We're going to be opening dozens of offices. We're going to be hiring and doubling staff and key places, things that really they had received some criticism for in the last couple of months for not doing sooner in terms of the infrastructure of a campaign. But you're also really seeing the president do this kind of delicate dance himself, where he is still trying to talk about administration priorities and things he can do in his capacity as president to try to really tell voters, here's why you need to, in his view, reelect me for four more years. So today he is doing this major initiative when it comes to women's health and trying to really advance the research portion of it and the study of it, that's something that the First Lady, Jill Biden, has really taken on as a key issue. And it's something that is grossly underfunded. So they really want to be sure to highlight that today. And these are the kinds of things that then when the president goes out and he campaigns and he's talking to voters, he can really, you know, lift them up and say, when women are coming to support me, this is a reason they might be. And they were critical to his victory in 2020. So they want to be sure to do that again. But he is going to be heading to Arizona 
Arizona to Nevada. He's going to be doing some more fundraising out on the West Coast, which has been critical to this effort. And you really saw in the last couple of weeks that the president is trying to sort of talk about every critical issue in the bucket of what they feel they've been able to accomplish so far in the administration, but the work that is left to do. And so I think you're going to see him talking about some of those key issues in the next couple of days, again, in the frame of what he thinks he could do with another term in office. And of Peter. course, not to be lost at all of this, the silent statement made by Maria Shriver, the cousin of Robert F. Kennedy Jr., who may be competing for the White House against Joe Biden and Donald Trump this fall. She obviously there standing behind Dr. Biden and the president himself. Monica Alba, Von Hilliard, we appreciate both of you. We do want to bring in our NBC News legal analyst, the former federal prosecutor and Georgetown law professor Paul Butler to join this conversation. Paul, so when it comes to the bloodbath comment or frankly any other incendiary language that Mr. Trump has used, will use, continues to use, legally speaking, where is the line between protected speech and potentially inciting violence? Peter, Trump is really testing that line in a way that no presidential candidate in recent memory ever has. Free speech is protected by the Constitution. Incitement is a crime under federal law promoting or encouraging others to throw a riot is a felony. You know, Trump usually has a plausible excuse, like here when he says he meant bloodbath in the financial sense. In the federal election case, there's a gag order that prohibits Trump from attacking witnesses, but gag orders wouldn't apply to political speech like this. I mean, this is a striking moment, right? We've seen a lot of moments like this, and it's one to sort of have the president, the former president, his allies defend their statements. It's another to consider how so many of those allies around this country, remember what he said, that the Proud Boys were listening. They took the message very differently than some other Americans may have taken his messages. Here's another thing he said repeatedly. He refers to federal criminal defendants behind bars due to their involvement in January 6th as hostages. He's repeated that. First, for our audience, we want to be clear, the overwhelming majority majority of those behind bars, the overwhelming majority of them behind bars have either pled guilty to crimes or have been convicted in court. It is very rare for January 6th defendants to be detained pre-trial, even when they were accused of a, a violent act during the attack on the Capitol. But on that topic, two of the men who were recently arrested in connection with the attack on the 6th and are being held pre-trial have actually killed people in the past. We just want to make that very clear for people who hear this language and when the president refers to, the former president refers to these uh, detainees or these convicts as hostages. How concerned, Paul, on that topic are you about the idea of a mass release? I'm extremely concerned, Peter. By Inauguration Day 2025, DLJ will have prosecuted around 2,000 people for crimes related to January 6th. Uh, they've been convicted of crimes relating from seditious conspiracy to criminal trespass. So under the Constitution, the president has the power to pardon people convicted of federal crimes or to commute their sentences. So could Trump pardon all of these people on day one? Yes. It would be highly unorthodox, not that that matters to Trump. But there's usually a painstaking process where a lawyer makes a detailed presentation to the Justice Department. There's an office of pardon attorney. That office can take years to decide a case. It often turns down people who seem very deserving because they've served years or decades in prison, and they clearly turned their lives around. So Trump's summary pardon will completely circumvent that process. Paul, I want to ask you about some of the other things that President, former President Trump, excuse me, is facing right now. I do want to tell everybody who's with us right now that the White House now tells us that President Biden has just wrapped up a call with the Prime Minister of Israel, Bibi Netanyahu, Benjamin Netanyahu. It is the first time that the two men have spoken in more than a month. Before that, it had been roughly 26 days before they had spoken the last time around. We'll get more of that reporting as we hear more from the White House. But back to you, Paul. Trump's attorneys, they filed a motion today responding to the nearly half a billion uh, dollar bond requirement imposed in the New York civil business fraud case, saying it is, quote, a practical impossibility to find the money. They say Mr. Trump's been turned down by 30 surety companies. What does that tell you about Trump's assets and about the future of Mr. Trump's appeal? 
So last week, Trump asked the judge to accept $100 million rather than the whole almost $500 million bond. The judge let him know that haggling is not a thing when you have to pulse bond. What Trump is basically doing is asking the court to trust him to pay up, which for any defendant would be a difficult task. But it's almost an impossible ask for a person who has been found liable for civil fraud. Basically, the jurors found that Trump lies about money and that he tries to get over on lenders. So it would be irresponsible for any judge to trust Trump to pay up now. So, Peter, there's a remedy that Letitia James certainly knows about. If right. he doesn't come right. out with that money on March 25th, she says she's got her eye on his property, including at 40 Wall Street. She'll have a legal right to start mm -hmm. seizing that property if he doesn't come up with the cash. Paul, there's a lot for folks to try to make sense of, keep track of right now. Another is the criminal hush money case. It was supposed to start next Monday. I think it was. The judge now delayed that until after the release of 100,000 pages of documents. Um, your reaction to Judge Mershon's decision and how that could really have a ripple effect on the other Trump legal cases in his campaign schedule. Could that impact the way the rest of some of these cases are heard? It absolutely will impact it. So the judge almost has to delay this trial. He's already delayed it a month. But considering that there was this document dump of about 100,000 pages that the, uh, uh, the U.S. Attorney's Office in New York just turned over to both the Trump defense and to the DA's office, they've all got a legal claim that they need more time to go over all of these papers. So that pushes it back at least one month. I wouldn't be surprised if it ends up being more time than that. So we're, we're kind of having a traffic jam, uh, Peter, with a, a bunch of trials that in theory could be ready to go in uh, the summer, June, July, and August. For many of those trials, that would mean the trial will continue uh, even during the election hmm. day. Honestly, I'm not sure that any of these cases at this point are going to go to trial before Election Day. Trump, when he's actually brought to judgment, usually loses. He wins by delay, delay, delay. And, Peter, it sure looks like he's winning now in all four cases. Yeah, publicly and privately, that has been the strategy for Mr. Trump and his allies. Paul Butler, a pleasure to have you. We appreciate your time and your expertise.